And so the next speaker will be Sefer Asadi talking about vertex color. Okay. I guess now I'm on. Okay, so thank you the organizer for inviting me and thank you everyone for coming. I'm going to talk about sublinear algorithms for delta plus one vertex coloring. This is joint work with my advisor Sanjeev Khanna and Penn and another student. So graph coloring, we all know the definition, just a quick recap. I have a graph, I have a palette of let's say size C colors and I want to choose a color from this palette for every vertex such that there are no monochromatic edges in the graph. Example, this is my graph. This is a palette of four colors. Then I'm going to color it like this. No edge has both its end point with the same color. This is a central problem in graph theory and computer science. And it has tons of different applications, mainly to scheduling and symmetry breaking. A special case of this problem is when my palette has size delta plus one. Delta here is the maximum degree in my graph, and for notation, I'm going to use n always to denote the number of vertices. So now I want to color my graph with delta plus one color. Well, why this is interesting? One reason is that every graph admits a delta plus one coloring, and this is the minimal number of such that this statement is true. Because for clicks and odd cycles, you actually need delta plus one colors. There are other reasons. One is that it's it's this very nice algorithmic property. If I give you any partial coloring of your graph, as long as this part is visible, you can always go ahead later and extend it to a proper delta plus one coloring. This is only true for this delta plus one coloring. Even graphs which are delta colorable does not have this property. And such a property is going to become very helpful in designing algorithms. And finally, this problem is related to tons of other fundamental problems such as maximal independent set, maximal matching, or edge coloring with two delta minus one edges colors. So we are going to focus on this problem. What do we know about this problem? It is a very simple sequential algorithm that solves this problem. Iterate over your vertices. For each vertex, pick one of the colors available to this vertex, meaning that this color should not appear it's in neighborhood. Why does this thing work? Because if your maximum degree is delta and you have delta plus one colors available to you, you will always find a color to color this vertex. So we have this extremely simple algorithm that solves this problem. And this is also it's a highly efficient algorithm. It requires linear time and space. In some sense, you cannot hope for anything better. But let's say, let's just ask this question. Can I get even more efficient algorithms? And to answer such a question, we have to look at this realm of sublinear algorithms. Some instance of sublinear algorithms, maybe I want a sublinear time algorithm. This means that I want to solve this problem faster than even reading my entire input. Or maybe a streaming algorithm, I'm going to even do not store my graph. I'm going to just make one, streamed its edges to you, and I want you to use a space much smaller than what is needed to store this graph and then solve the problem. There is also this massively parallel computation model. It basically tries to capture the sort of map reducer style computation and where you want to have a sublinear communication between the machines. And in fact, for the purpose of this talk, it doesn't really matter what are the exact definition of these models. We have seen them throughout the talks here, but let's not really worry about that. And I'll tell you why in some time. And by the way, uh, it's a workshop on sublinear algorithms. I don't think I need to motivate sublinear algorithms. They're good. <laughs> so now the question is that can we design sublinear algorithms for delta plus one coloring? I know this is the time I'm giving you this prep talk for sublinear algorithms. That probably not really. Why? Well, one reason is that if I look at similar problems to this delta plus one coloring, this is provably impossible to do these things. For maximal independence, uh, we prove in the same paper that there is no sublinear space streaming algorithm. And for maximal matching, we prove that there is no sublinear time algorithm. These are somewhat a straightforward result, but they are not trivial still to prove. So in some sense, it says that if I look at the problems in this family, they are hard, so maybe delta plus one coloring is hard. There's this informal reasons that basically 
in sublinear algorithms, you usually need some extra room to work with. Exact problems tends to be hard. So we need to allow for some sort of approximation. The most meaningful, perhaps, approximation here is to let me give you some extra more colors, maybe delta plus some constant times delta more colors, or order delta color. OK? So any questions so far? Uh, for the maximal independent set result, where is this from? Uh, so these are both in this paper. So when you say something here, is it the number of vertices or edges? Edges. Yeah, so our output size is proportional to number of vertices, so I'm talking about sublinear number of edges. So what is our result? Surprisingly, in fact, it turns out that we can get sublinear algorithm for this problem, despite this time. And so I'm going to show you we can get actually very efficient sublinear algorithms for delta plus one color. Before that, let me just say this. Our algorithms are all going to be randomized. You are going to obtain a delta plus one coloring with high probability. If not, they are going to output that they failed. So they are never going to output a coloring which is not visible. And this is important in these sublinear algorithms because if I give you a color, coloring, checking whether it was feasible or not is actually provably impossible in these models. Okay? So now let's talk about a result. One is about sublinear time algorithms. We are going to have, assume some certain access to our graph. This is the standard access. I can ask for a degree of a vertex, check whether a vertex is neighbor to another one, and ask for k at neighbor of a vertex. Prior to our work, we didn't know any sublinear time algorithm for this problem. And in fact, the fastest, al fastest algorithm we knew for this problem is this age-old greedy algorithm. We showed that, in fact, you can improve upon this algorithm and get an n root n time algorithm for doing delta plus one coloring. So if your graph is not too sparse, you can actually color it faster than this simple greedy algorithm that we saw. Okay. And this algorithm has this nice property that its queries are going to be chosen non-adoptively. So this is in some sense the most simplest form of a sublinear time algorithm. You're just going to decide on your queries beforehand, ask all of them from the graph, look at them, and then just based on those queries, answer your question. You don't need to interact with the graph anymore. And the running time is n root n. We proved that actually omega n root n query to your graph are also necessary, even for adoptive algorithm. So this algorithm is optimal. What? The streaming algorithms. So we saw in Michael Stock semi streaming algorithms, I'm only going to focus on one pass algorithms where the edges are coming in the stream. Previously, again, we didn't know any sublinear space algorithm for this problem, but parallel to our work, people also look at this problem. They did this idea of let's relax the problem, let's look at an easier problem of delta plus a small of delta coloring, and for that, people come up with a semi-streaming algorithm. And later in the talk, I'll tell you actually why allowing for this extra relaxation can make the problem much easier. Our result is that we, you don't need this relaxation. We can actually also get a single pass streaming algorithm for delta plus one coloring in, with O tilde O n space. Again, for this problem, this space is nearly optimal because omega n space is necessary just to output the solution. And interestingly, this algorithm works even if I have edge insertion and deletion in my graph. This isn't somewhat surprising because even for maximal matching that we have good insertion only a streaming algorithm, probably you cannot solve them in dynamic graph stream. It's still delta plus one coloring is solvable there. And finally, for this MPC model. So, so, so could you, uh, on the previous slide, you had a lower bound for, uh, was that uh, of n by delta? Uh, uh, one slide back, I think you had a lower bound. Uh, oh, no, sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, the next one? Actually, it was good to you there. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, right, so I, no streaming algorithm for delta. No, no, no we didn't know. Uh, such an streaming. This is not a lower one because we oh, are giving oh, I that. See. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, then go back and understand. 
others. So this is interesting when delta is at least two then, right? Yes. So if delta is less than root n, uh, the lower bound continues to hold the omega and root n type the okay. lower bonds. Even if so, so, sorry, let's speak it. You'll always get n delta because if I give you neighbor queries, you can solve it with n delta, no? Okay, okay. okay. Yeah. If I do not give you neighbor queries, I believe you can prove that n root n is needed even when delta is smaller. Okay. But we cannot, in this more generality, we cannot prove it because it's just simply not true. When delta is smaller, you can solve it in n delta time always. So we went over this. Okay, MPC algorithm. Yeah, and I'm not going to define the model, but here basically you take your graph, you partition its edges between multiple machines. Machines can talk with each other as long as they do not send or receive more than, let's say, order and commit or tilde and communication in each round. We knew a bunch of results here. There was a log log delta times log a star round and algorithm for n memory for this delta plus one coloring. Parallel to our work, this was improved to log a star n rounds. And for this easier problem of delta plus some extra colors, constant round algorithm with more space were known. Our result improve upon all of this. We get constant round and order and memory for this problem. And what is to me really interesting is that if I make this assumption of a public randomness, so suppose the machines have access to a public set of random coins, then you can solve this problem in exactly one round. If not, basically the extra rounds are only needed to share these random bits. Maybe you need one or two more rounds depending on the exact model. <coughs> Let's just skip this. So I bombarded you with all these different results. I'm not going to talk about them anymore. The main result of the paper is actually not any of this, but it's a, a structural result about delta plus one coloring, which I think will be useful in other settings as well. What is that result? It's this very simple looking statement. It says that, look at your graph G. For each vertex, sample log and colors, let's say un uniformly at random, with repetition or without repetition, it doesn't matter that much. Then for each vertex, store these colors that you sampled, log n colors. You can use these sample colors to color the whole graph. You don't need to have access to any more colors. Let me show you an example. With high probability. With high probability, so yes. All of our randomized algorithms are with high probability. This is my graph. These are the palettes next to each of them. Maximum degree of this graph is five here, so I have six available colors to each vertex. Clearly, if I use these palettes, I can color this graph. What we are claiming is that sample these palettes, each of them uniformly at random, to just get log n colors. So you are going to get something like this. This result says that with high probability, you can still color your graph. Okay. Once again, what was the result? How many colors? It uh, order log n colors. But per vertex, right? Per vertex. And, and it's extremely important, yes. <laughs> Independently per each vertex, not every graph is colorable with log n global colors. Okay. For each vertex, I'm sampling uh, independently order log n colors. Okay. So, why is such a result useful, Ivan? I want to argue that that result is enough to get all these sublinear algorithms immediately. Why? Well, look at this type of algorithm. Look at your graph. Sample this log n colors for each vertex. And then look at each edge in your graph. If the least on the end point of this edge do not intersect, just delete that edge from your graph. OK? How many colors remain in my graph? Well, I have how many edges remain in my graph? I had n delta edges. Each of them, one of its endpoints sample log n colors. Each of these colors appear on the other endpoint with probability log n over delta. So this graph has n log square and edges with high probability. Okay. But I only need this graph to 
get the coloring I talked about. So if I can least color this graph, use these palettes to color this graph, I get a delta plus one coloring of my original graph. So this says that basically, look at your graph, you can non-adoptively reduce its n delta edges to only order n edges, and you are still able to color it with delta plus one colors. Example is that suppose this was my sampled colors. Look at this edge here, for example. I really don't need this edge in my graph anymore because this edge is never going to make a problem for any colors that I choose because those lists do not intersect. So I'm just going to drop it and all other edge. I'll get a sparser graph. So this is really just a sparsification result for this problem. And then I color it. So I want to talk about this result for some time, basically for the rest of the talk. But is there any question so far? I'm trying to get some intuition behind this. So if I had a star, right? What's confusing me is that sampling only log in colors. How do you even know the difference between delta versus delta plus one? Okay. But you know they are sampling from delta plus one colors each of them. So, so but a star is also colorable with delta, no? A star is colorable with just two colors. So, yeah. So a click is a good example, and I'm going to show you why click is uh, good. So let's talk about this problem now. This result. Let me try to reformulate graph coloring as some sort of an assignment problem. It's nothing fancy. It's basically just the same definition. It's going to just be a bit more helpful for us. Let me start with the example of a click. Suppose I want to color a six click. This is my click on six vertices. I'm going to map it to this graph, which I'm going to call a palette graph. Vertices of my original graph forms the left vertices. The colors form the right vertices. And I put a complete bipartite graph between them. OK, so is the definition clear? What does delta plus 1 coloring mean here? It's just finding a perfect matching in this palette graph. No? Because the moment I find a perfect matching, I look at which color is matched to which vertex and go ahead and color it the same way in my original graph. Okay. What does palette sparsification mean? So, so sorry, but this seems uh, sort of specific to the click. Yes, yes. I, I'll, okay. This is just for the click. Because otherwise you don't have enough. Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. So for the moment, for click. What does palette sparsification mean when I'm working with a click? It means that if I look at a random subgraph of a bipart complete bipartite graph, or in other words, if I look at a random bipartite graph, this graph contains a perfect matching. These statements are basically palette sparsification for complete graphs is equivalent to saying that a random bipartite graph contains a perfect matching. Good. But we know these results from random graph theory. A random bipartite graph with degree log n has a perfect matching with high probability. So this immediately proves the palette sparsification for clicks. Good. Let me look at a slightly more general graph. Suppose I had a click, I remove a perfect matching from it. So this is my click, but I remove these edges. Okay. Maximum degree now draw is dropped by one. Okay. So I have to color this graph with five colors instead of six. Again, I create the palette graph. Delta plus one coloring means finding a good subgraph. Let me not define it formally. But informally, what is a good subgraph? Well, I do not have enough colors to match every vertex to a unique color. But I don't need to do that also. Some vertices here can be matched to more than one vertex. OK? What are those vertices? Those vertices should not have an edge between themselves in the original graph. So delta plus 1 coloring basically means finding such a good subgraph in a, in a complete bipartite graph, which is a slightly lopsided. What does palette sparsification means for this type of graph is that proving that random bipartite graphs contain such good subgraphs. Okay. Somehow here you said that you, you took this vertex, which uh, the, the top vertex on the right, and you connected it to the pair of vertices that don't have a, yes. an edge. So in general, yeah. It should be an independent set on the other side. Yeah, sure, I see. 
that's the formulation. Okay. So already this is again some random graph theory question. Okay. And already here it becomes a slightly harder than just proving that exists a matching, but this is not also that hard to prove. So now what is the general formulation? I give, I'll take my graph, turn it into a palette graph, and then in that graph I want to find a subgraph which has this property. Every vertex on the left should be matched to exactly one vertex on the light, right. Vertices on the right can be matched to multiple vertices on the left as long as these vertices form an independent set in my original graph. Good. I agree this is an extremely convoluted definition, and, but it works. So, so palette sparsification reduces to just solving some random graph theory question. What is good is that this re reformulation is very helpful when I'm talking about a structure which looks like a click, click minus an edge, click minus a matching. Okay. This formulation is terrible when I want to talk about graphs which are very far from being a click, because then the structure becomes so unpredictable that basically I do not have any good handle on that. Okay. So let's introduce one more idea. So we are going to use this formulation when I'm talking about things which are like click. What if I don't have something which is click? Let's go to the other extreme case. Let's say I have a graph which is far from being a click. What is a good example? I have a low degree graph. Okay. Let's, for example, assume that I have a graph which all of its vertices have degrees smaller than delta over 2. Okay. I know this is cheating because delta is the maximum degree of my graph. So if you like, add one vertex of degree delta, just isolate it somewhere. Okay. So, okay, so that formulation is hard, but how can we pr prove palette sparsification for this type of graphs? Can I imagine? This is actually very easy. Let me show you a procedure. How do we want to do this? Let me introduce a, an algorithm or a procedure for doing this. So look at your vertices. For each vertex, sample a color uniformly at random from 1 to delta plus 1. Okay? Always just from 1 to delta plus 1, nothing adoptive. Look at this vertex. If this color is never sampled in the neighborhood of this vertex and is not assigned to any of them, then assign that color to this vertex. Okay? And then repeat this process over many iterations until all of your vertices are colored. So many of you have seen distributed algorithms, Lubia style algorithms for coloring, for delta plus one coloring. This is not that algorithm. What is different, I'm always sampling from one to delta plus one. I'm never, basically this algorithm doesn't make any adoptive decision. Always just sample from one to delta plus one. If I succeed in coloring that, that vertex, I color it, otherwise I'll move on. Why is this good? Look, every vertex has a degree smaller than delta over 2. I'm sampling from delta colors, okay? So in my neighborhood, the only delta over 2 of these colors are being used. Each step, I have probability half of coloring this vertex, okay? So every vertex will be colored with probability half in each step. I need log n iteration, I'm done. What does this thing have to do with palette sparsification? Well, you can just simulate this algorithm by the colors we sampled for each vertex. No? I look at the first color I sampled, I'll assign it if I could. If not, I'll go. And it says that you only need to go to log n colors. So this also proves this theorem when my graph is sufficiently low degree. And sufficient is just delta over 2, or just some constant factor away from delta. Okay. So I show you these special cases. Now how does the general proof look like? We could handle clicks, we could handle low degree graphs, let's interpolate between them. What is the catch? Is that I show you two different approach. Each of them works for that specific regime, but they don't say anything about the other one. I told you this assignment formulation is just very bad to talk about low degree graphs. And this graph coloring algorithm I show you for low degree graphs probably requires delta iterations on a click. Okay. So you cannot just use that proof there. So let's combine these ideas. And our approach is basically try to get our graph, decompose it into some clicks and some dense part, some sparse part, 
and try to massage these ideas to work for them. To do that, we are going to use this brilliant result by Harris, Schneider, and Sue to actually give a network decomposition for delta plus one coloring. So this is called HSS decomposition. We have to extend and modify it. I'm just going to show you the modification. It's a very small modification, and I'll tell you where we modified it. So what does this decomposition say? It says that look at any graph and any parameter epsilon between zero and one. You can partition vertices of your graph as follows. You are going to have some vertices which we are going to call a sparse vertices. These vertices, look at this blue vertex, are such that their neighborhood is epsilon far from being a clique. What does that mean? It means that if I look at all of its neighbor, this subgraph here is missing epsilon fraction of edges of a clique. Okay? So immediately, any low degree graph, any low degree vertex is a sparse vertex. Okay? Because you basically do not have enough edges there to begin with. But even with this definition, you may have some vertices which have degree equal to the maximum degree and are still as sparse because their neighborhood doesn't have many edges. Okay? So, so some of my vertices are going to be a sparse vertices. If I remove those vertices, I'll end up with these subgraphs, a collection of a bunch of subgraphs that we are going to call them almost clicks. Each almost click is a structure like this. It's a subgraph on delta, roughly delta vertices, give or take epsilon delta. Any vertex in this subgraph has at most epsilon delta neighbors outside. Okay. And it has at most epsilon delta non-neighbors inside. Let's look at this shape. These red vertices form an almost clique because they are basically a clique. Maybe some edges are missing here and some of them have some edges out. Okay. And HSS decomposition tell us that any graph can be decomposed like this. Basically the extension that I said is just proving this part. HSS decomposition does not give you any lower bond on size of these cliques, and for their purpose, it's completely okay if clique has size even delta over two. We crucially need them to be really cliques of size delta. With some minor modification, you get this. Good. So, what is our goal? Our goal is to prove this statement. If I have a graph, if for each vertex independently I sample log n colors, I can still color all of my graph with high probability. How does the proof look like? Well, let's just fix some of the, one of these decomposition for some tiny epsilon, some constant is enough. Okay, one over thousand. The sparse vertices, we can handle them easily, really. Let's just use a bunch of these colors, these log n colors that we have, and go ahead and color them. And this is the easy part, why? Well, these are not exactly low degree vertices, low degree graphs, but they have essentially the same structure and that simulation argument actually works here. It requires some work, but people, especially in the distributed community, have studied these type of problems a lot, okay? And we can just piggyback on those results. So this part is just a simulation argument. Now the main part is to try to color these structures which look like clicks. To do that, we are going to do as follows. We are going to look at one click. Just assume that you color everything else in your graph. It doesn't matter how you color them. Just look at the vertices here. And I'm going to claim that if I look at the color sampled by these vertices, I can color this part. So I'm going to color this almost click independently. Then I'm going to look at the next one. It doesn't matter how it is colored outside. Even if all of them are colored, we can color this thing still. And let me tell you just some sort of an illustration. And basically, this is really all of the proofs is happening here. Okay. And this requires some generalization of that assignment formulation I show you. So let's just do a quick example. Suppose this was my original graph. Some decomposition look like this. Blue vertices are sparse vertices. I have this almost click here, and another almost click here. 
good. So I'll decompose my graph like this. And let's accept that this part is easy to color. I use half of the colors I sample for vertices in this palette of sparsification, I color this part. Okay. The main part is how to color this graph here. And it looks like a structure like this, so I have this vertex. Let's look at the assignment formulation. It gives me this palette graph. Now one quick thing, this is no more a bipartite, complete bipartite graph. Why? Because these vertices have neighbors outside. So for example, this guy here does not have an edge to the blue vertex. Or this one does not have an edge to the yellow vertex. The main technical result here is that we are going to show that random subgraphs of these type of palette graphs actually contain those good subgraphs that I define. Okay. So what is the definition of good subgraph again? Uh, any vertex on left has degree one. Any vertex on right can be matched to arbitrary number of vertices on the left as long as they form an independent set in the original graph. Okay? So for example, here a good subgraph is just a matching, basically. Can you go back one second? Yeah. Uh, no. Oh, okay. What if two almost fits our neighbors? Yeah, and that will make problem, okay? <coughs> but, but what I told you is that we color one almost click. We assume everything else is colored, okay? So it doesn't matter. I color this one, even if that guy is neighbor to it, I'm going to just assume they have colors, and I'm going to color this one. If they don't have colors, my life is just going to be easier because I'll get less conflict, okay? But yeah, definitely we are going to have some almost clicks which are neighbors to each other. Good. And so this turns out to be some random graph theory type question. We are going to use similar types of ideas and prove this, and let's believe it can be proven. What is the real challenge here? It's just that size of this almost clits can be very large. It can be one plus epsilon delta. So you have to match one vertex on the right to many vertices on the left. And at the same time, these graphs are not complete bipartite graphs, so you are missing some edges also. So it's really not completely random bipartite graph. Some subset of something which looks like a clique, and we have to prove that it contains a, it, uh, we have to prove that it contains a good subgraph. And the reason that we can prove it is that we put many, uh, lots of a structure on this palette graph by ensuring that it really looks like a clique. Okay. Yeah. Do you assume that the edges of, that are deleted from the palette graph are adversarial or do you use the fact no, that you have to assume we, ha we assume they are adversarial but there is some structure still we know how many of them are being deleted okay so every vertex for example we know have degree something like one minus epsilon delta so, but yeah we are not going to assume they are randomly deleted so we color that part we do the same strategy we color this part we color the whole thing and this gives us the proof of this sparsification theorem. So let me just very quickly tell you why we get sublinear algorithms here. Basically, we get this algorithm. This is the sublinear algorithm. Use, use palette sparsification, sample the graph, sample the colors to get this sparsified graph. Let's call it conflict graph. Color this graph. Find the least coloring of this graph. So what I have to do is to just show you that this conflict graph can be found in each model separately. And that's the only way we are going to treat these different models separately. In sublinear time model, we are going to give you an algorithm that finds this, uh, finds this conflict graph in n delta, minimum of n delta, and n square over delta time and queries, which translates into n row 10. In a streaming, it's just trivial. Whenever your edges are coming, you can just decide for your own whether it belongs to the conflict graph or not, and if yes, just a story. Same way with MPC. We got the algorithm this way, but there is a catch here. Anyone see what is the issue? At least coloring is slow or something? Yes, exactly. So what we've done is that we turned a linear time solvable problem into an MP hard problem. 
The reason is that this palette of falsification is an information theoretic result, not computational. What it means is that information theoretically, a conflict graph is all we need to color it. But computationally, this problem is in general MP hard. Maybe for a streaming and MPC, it's not that big deal. But for a sublinear time algorithm, we cannot get a sublinear time algorithm from an MP hard. So we have to go back, address this. This basically translates into turning this information theoretic result into an algorithmic result. And this means that if you, in addition to the conflict graph, you also give me that decomposition, or even some approximate version of that, then we design an algorithm that can least color this graph in n root n time. And n root n time here is actually the time needed to find a perfect matching in a bipartite graph with order n edges, which we'll get from hopcroft karpa algorithm. And this gives us the n root n time algorithm, sublinear algorithm also. And then one step remains, because we need the decomposition, we have to design some algorithms in these sublinear models also to find the decomposition. And this part requires some work, but this is a straightforward. We have lots of tools in these models for doing this. And now this is the whole sublinear algorithms. Yeah. So let me conclude quickly. Well, we obtained sublinear algorithm for delta plus one coloring. These are the runtime or space. All of these ones we proved are optimal. And we also proved some lower one to contrast this problem with seemingly very similar looking problems. Central tool here was this palette sparsification theorem. And let me mention some open questions here. One, my I think, yes, this is my main, the most interesting question at this point to me is to get deterministic sublinear algorithms for this problem. And by that, I really mean the streaming. For MPC, I do not care that much. And for sublinear time, I think it's easy to prove that you cannot do it deterministically. Can we get a streaming single pass, preferably if not multi-pass, even n to the small of one passes algorithm for this problem? Okay. But determinist. What it is interesting is that it has some informal connections also to getting deterministic distributed algorithms for this problem, which is a longest standing open problem. Also, this family of maximal type problems, delta plus one coloring, maximal independence, uh, maximal matching, I think these are really interesting problems that you need to understand them more in these models. So, one question here is that can we solve maximal independence set? in sublinear time or in a multi-pass stream. Because we proved that in single pass you cannot do this. And here there are actually known upper bonds. There is a recent result that implies a log log n pass algorithm. But there's no reason to assume that's optimal. Okay. And finally, this very general question that can we, we've become very efficient in sublinear algorithms to take a greedy algorithm, massage it, and turn it into sublinear algorithms. The problem is that these algorithms are typically adoptive or multi-pass in the stream. Think of matching problem, getting a better than two approximation for matching. Some of the main open question in graph streaming. In two pass, we can do it for this reason that we can take a greedy algorithm and implement it in two pass. We cannot do it in one pass. So can we come up with some non-adoptive sparsification instead, instead of using greedy algorithms to address these type of problems? That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, so plenty of time for questions. So I've got a question. Um, so uh, <laughs> um, if you know there's a promise that the graph has a, has a delta coloring, or a delta minus one coloring, um, the, the, can you apply your algorithms? No, no, actually it doesn't work for this reason that I can show you a lower bond in all of these models actually. The delta coloring, even if you know it's doable, it's hard in these models. So it's really, our results are very sensitive to delta plus one and delta. Is it because of the computational thing? Or the no, no, just, no. So delta coloring is not MP hard. You can do it. The only graphs which are not delta 
color bar by Brooks theorem or clicks and odd cycles. Okay, so it's not a computational problem. Information theoretically, you can prove a single pass streaming algorithm. If it wants to delta color a graph, it requires omega n square space. So I'm asking about your theorem. Does it hold for? If it's delta colorable, if you randomly choose. Oh, again, no, it won't work again, even for that. So, okay, so I told you delta plus one coloring has this very nice property that if you fix color of any part of your graph, no matter how you did that, you can still extend it to a delta plus one coloring. Okay? So, where do you use that one for the time that you are doing for clicks? Nearly all of these results are based on, they are using that implicitly, but the click part is explicitly using that, that the rest of it, we just do not care how we color it, okay? But it's used implicitly here. That property is not satisfied for delta coloring. Yeah. Are there any applications of the HNC theorem that are not computational? Other applications? To, you mean other applications to other problems? Or, no, I do not know. I mean, it has applications to edge coloring also because you can reduce two delta minus one edge coloring, I guess, some sort of vertex coloring. But, no, I do not. But it has lots of application to delta plus one coloring in congested click, local model, etc. So great, so if there are no more questions, I think this speaker one more time. And I think the last session will start at, at four. Have a break.